and hopefully it's really big compared to the T crits or the F crits. And if that's the case, if you get this test statistics that's really, really big, bigger than the critical value, what do you get to set? Is the null hypothesis true or is the alternative hypothesis true? Alternative. The alternative, alternative, right? You're rejecting the null hypothesis. You're saying it just can't be due to chance. That these, the odds of it being due to chance are really, really low. That's what we're talking about here with what your research finds. The null hypothesis is true when your F or your T or your R is really small, and it's false, or it's the alternative is true when you have a really big test, test statistic, in particular when your p-value is lower than the alpha level that you set. Make sure that you remember what p-values and <coughs> alpha levels are, because that's an important concept. But, and this is the big but, we said your research also has to kind of match up with reality. And unfortunately, you never really know what's going on here with your research. So if you find something in a study where you say, eh, it looks like there's no difference, it looks like there's no effect, what you're kind of hoping for is that in reality there is no effect, right? Maybe there's no relationship between age and the number of friends people have. So if you find in your research there's no relationship, then you're hoping that that means in reality there's no relationship between these so you can leave it. But when you're running your study, because you're sampling, because you're never certain, you're not looking at the entire population, if you have to retain that null hypothesis, if you have to say it's true, you should be in the back of your mind saying, yeah, did I commit a type 2 error? Did I say there's no relationship or did I say there's no effect? When in reality there is. You can't test it. There's no way to actually <coughs> test for a type 2 error. But you'll talk when you get into statistics classes about how you can estimate your chances of having done that. But, but the idea here with a type 2 error is it just sometimes pops up, and when you don't get to re reject that null hypothesis, this is the error you're worried about. You're worried about, did I just retain a null hypothesis when in reality I shouldn't? Not because you're doing the stats wrong, but just because you're designing the experiments in a way that doesn't allow you to find that significant effect. The same thing works for if you reject the null hypothesis. In reality, if you say, there's a difference, or there's an effect here, you want it to match up with what's going on in the real world. So you want to say, yes, there's a relationship between these two variables, or yes, or, this drug has an effect, and it not only is something I found in my research, but I see it in the world. So there's an overlap here. But you always have to worry that when you run a study, you could have committed a type 1 error. Sometimes it's just dumb chance. Sometimes things like demand characteristics or the placebo effect can kind of create these effects in a lab that don't replicate in the real world. And when that happens, you're committing a type 1 error. When your research says, reject the null, reject the null, you found something, but in reality you really didn't. Not that you did something again wrong with your statistics, but just you know, something happened in your study that's not allowing it to match up with what's happening outside of the lab, outside of your research. Does that make sense? So the two errors that we're thinking about are type 2 and type 1. You want to know the specifics to them. Not necessarily how to calculate them out, but you want to know, you know what they are and how they're so important when you get to that point where you're making conclusions about the research. And, uh, sorry, I had a little confusion about what you said about the null hypothesis being true and the null hypothesis being true in terms of accurate being a smiley face. Don't we not want the null hypothesis well, to be true? Well, you don't necessarily want it to be true, but if you you say it's true, you want it to match up with reality, right? You want to say, that I, don't, I didn't find a difference between the groups, okay. and you want to say, you know... Okay, that we're correct thinking yeah, that we didn't find the... the okay. There is no difference between the groups. Thank it's you. not, we should probably have it as kind of a, a, a happy face with kind of downturn lips, because <laughs> you're happy that your research is matching up with reality, you didn't do something wrong, but you're probably not thrilled because you didn't find a significant effect. Okay, thank you. Those were the three, right? Oh, um, or is there one more? I think there was one more, sorry. Yeah. No, that's the next slide. Yes, the next one. Thank you. Um, just trying to understand what's represented ah, here. So, yeah. so what we were talking about here is this idea of statistical significance. So we talked about how when you're running your tests, you're going to get that T, that F, or that R, whatever it is, and that's going to be the thing that you use to estimate if you actually have it to reject that null hypothesis. So as we talked about you know, this test statistic and how we're going to compare the P that we get from our test statistic to an alpha. 
And what we talked about originally was, look, if your P is smaller than your alpha, or if your test statistic is bigger than your critical value, that's when you get to say, yay, I'm rejecting the null hypothesis. But as a researcher, it's not just like you run a study and it doesn't matter how many people you have or what you do with your study, that it determines if you're going to, to get a null hypothesis to be rejected. When you're running your research, sample size and having decreased variance really enhances your chances of finding an effect if there actually is an effect. So, so we talked here about how when I'm comparing groups, if I have a small amount of range in the variance of whatever the variable is I'm collecting, and that's going to give me a really good chance of rejecting the null hypothesis if I should. Imagine me kind of giving you guys a pop quiz where I, I give you one group of you a special type of training, so I, I teach you all this type of stuff, I do all these neat things, and then that group takes a pop quiz, and the other group doesn't get any special training, and they take a pop quiz. But then when I look at the scores, in each group, the scores are everywhere. So there's people that are getting ones, and forties, and tens, and it's just everywhere. Well, even if I find a difference between those groups, I might not be sure that that difference is legitimate. Right? There's just so much movement that it's just kind of random. But if everybody in one group, say in a test from 1 to 40, gets somewhere between 35 and 38 points in one group and, and between 15 and 18 points in the other group, I'm not only going to find really big differences, but because there's so little variability, I can say definitely due to the manipulation. That, that's what's happening. Or, and we did this when we did different samples, what was it that we asked you guys to do? I think it was the number of classes you're taking, right? Something like that. So, so we, we looked at as we increased the group sizes, we had less and less variability from group to group. So if I looked at the groups of two, pairs of two, how many classes they were taking on average, we'd be all over the place. But if I took groups of three, then our group averages would start coming a little bit closer to the population average. If I took groups of ten, then we'd start really getting close to the population average. And that's what we're talking about here with, with ability to detect effects. If we have small amounts of variance in the variable that we're measuring, or if we have really big sample sizes, so our two samples that we're comparing are really close to each other, that's when we get really good estimates of the population, and that's when we really increase our chances that we do see an effect of being able to reject the line. So in that chart where there wasn't a, I don't know, if, is that considered a whole lot of? What, so K plus 10? So in the different lines, they each represent... And don't worry about this too much. So, so this idea here is that when you've got a certain number of groups, you know, what are your chances of, of finding kind of a, a normal distribution in something that's a little bit less spread out? And what you see here, just pull it in, i got to actually change the picture, is that as your sample sizes get bigger and bigger, so as you get to k equals 10, you have almost all of your scores kind of centered around this middle. Very few extreme scores, extreme averages happen within the groups. And it's probably not the best example of how this works. If we had like a skewed distribution or something like that, that would make it even easier to understand. But, but the big thing I want you to get here is that more people causes less variance. And less variance gives you a much better chance to find significance. Thank you. Uh, no, I realize my question was, was that uh, not a knowledge question, but an understanding question. Oh, so. uh, okay. So you're good? Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, we were just... Uh...